Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, how are you? Thank you for coming out. Um, wow, feels good tonight. Thank you. Um, so very fortunate to have these two folks with us this, uh, this evening to share their insights about animation casting. Um, so let's bring them out and get it all started. Um, please welcome Sarah Sherman. And Aaron Drown. Very nice. Thank you for being here. Yeah, the dress code is uh, in full effect tonight. So <laughs> we got the memo. We got the memo. Nice job. Um, so I guess we'll start from the beginning, like we like to do, and just kind of get some background on each of you. Um, how you got started in the world of animation casting? What brought you to this field, and and what keeps you in it? Ah. I'll start, I guess. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. We are very excited to be up here talking to you guys. Um, so I started at a company called Klasky Chupo uh, in development. There you go. We got one person. Anyone? There we got two. Excellent. Um, they do shows like Rugrats, As Told by Ginger, Rocket Power. Anyone else? I got a few more people. Thank you very much. Um, doing development and then my boss at the time uh, moved over to head up uh, Disney TV animation for the development department Her name was Meredith Roberts. Her name still is Meredith Roberts um, And uh, she gave me my first job in development and so I actually started in development um, and uh, Realized that is not the career that I wanted. I was there for about a year and uh, Through the development process I kept going down to the casting department and meeting this awesome guy Dave Wright and I got to help cast uh, some of the projects from the development side and um, Then I said this is way better than development, please So I begged him to take me as a coordinator and he for some reason agreed so I started out as a coordinator, and I was there for 12 years, uh, coordinator, manager, director, executive director. And then uh, in January, I left uh, Disney, and I started working for Jon Stewart at his new animation studio doing um, political parodies. And uh, that didn't end up working out for uh, Jon Stewart and HBO, so that ended up getting uh, closed down. And now I'm doing freelance casting and dialogue directing and coaching. Superb. Well done. Right. Beat that. Go. Now I realize that I should always go first when answering this question. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, you know, and I'm still trying to figure out if casting is something I want to do. Uh, I haven't decided yet. I've also been doing it for, I guess, over a dozen years, but uh, maybe, maybe. Um, no, uh, so for me, I went to film school. I knew I was going to be in entertainment in some form or fashion. Uh, came out to LA, uh, kind of did the I'll work at a talent agency, um, bopped around a bit. Uh, I ended up temping it uh, at Disney in a, the casting department and kind of just saw this group of people having a great time. And I was like, oh, uh, that seems fun. Um, uh, but I didn't stay there at the time. I tried some other things, worked in publishing, did some writing. Um, but eventually I found myself. Uh, back there uh, with the same group of people. And uh, yeah, I've been there for, uh, it's Dave Wright, the same guy. Uh, so yeah, I've been there for a while. Well, he's the, he's someone we should all know then, Dave Wright. Okay. He knows Got how it. to pick talent, I'll say that. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Right. But uh, Aaron and I have kind of been in the same cubicle, in the same office next to each other for a dozen years. A long years. time, right? Yeah. So quite a while, definitely. Yeah. Okay, dynamic duo of sorts, if will. Um, I guess getting into the, act, the idea of how you go about casting for projects, um, where does it begin? Does it begin with a story idea and then when are you brought in in the process and how does that sort of come together? Uh, yeah, like we, uh, uh, you know, at Disney, as soon as they uh, are getting a project that's close to getting greenlit, um, we try to get in uh, right on the bottom floor. Um, so, uh, you know, it could be just the nugget uh, uh, of an idea at that point, or they can have a fully fleshed out script, or they could have like a short or something. So we like to get in uh, early enough and have that conversation about, hey, have you got voices in your head for this character? Have you thought about voices at all? Sometimes um, they'll have something very specific. Sometimes they'll have a specific actor that they either want to try to get or, you know, something that sounds like that actor. Um, sometimes they won't have thought about voices at all if they're just artists and they've been drawing this picture and this is all, all, 
uh, all they're thinking about. So we like to get in there as early as possible um, because, uh, you know, in, in the Dream of Dreams, we would be, uh, you know, casting actors to really influence the character before the character is fully formed so that the actor really has a part in that. Um, yeah, I've said enough about that. Sarah? I agree. Um, no, but I think, uh, you know, in the project I was just working on, so think about it, uh, news for animation, you have to turn around whatever we're parodying very, very, very quickly to be topical. Um, obviously, South Park can turn things around very quickly, um, and they do it in a couple of weeks. I'm talking a couple of hours, a couple of days. Um, so that's very fast casting and uh, recording. But then, and what's tricky is that you can't really plan for that. Um, I don't know if somebody is going to put out a tweet this morning that is going to send a firestorm down, and then I'm going to have to be parodying that in a couple of hours, saying, great, so I know one player I probably already have a voice for and maybe have had to do a sounder like four in the past because there might have been other instances where I've had to do something with a parody. But then the other two people, I might not have sound alikes for, and I might have to do a whole casting, and then I start to say, great, am I doing a parody of these characters? Do people know what they sound like? Um, or am I trying to get exact sound alike voices? Um, so, you know, I try to get in as quickly as possible, try to, you know, keep tabs on the news, see what's happening, so I can have a rough idea of what my day is going to be like. Um, but again, I don't know, I didn't know what news was going to hit, when it was going to hit, and how fast we were going to have to turn something around. So, um, it's always good to have actors that I know in mind, actors that I like, actors that I know can cover uh, multiple roles for me, that can do a lot of sound alikes and can really knock it out of the park uh, instantaneously. Now, were they coming in to work with you directly, typically, or were they doing these things from home? The cool thing is, because of the fast turnaround, I didn't have time for people to get to a studio, so they were recording at home, and I was Skyping with them or talking with them uh, to direct them, and then they'd email me in the MP3s, and then I would email it. What? Oh, it's like, I'm telling the truth. <laughs> I believe every word. <laughs> yeah, so it was a very fast turnaround, so I didn't have time for people to get to the studio. So just trying to uh, get the dialogue as fast as possible so people could start animating it as quickly as they could. That's amazing. Um, so then at Disney, I take it's a different process, right? So people do come in quite a bit. I mean, how does that work with uh, recording um, on a series, for instance? Hmm. So what? <laughs> Yeah, it was fast. Well, actually, well, you're talking about um, when you cast actors, let's well, switch gears. You have actors that are cast for a project. How involved, then, are you as a casting director in that part of the process when they're recording um, for a particular series? Did you say after they're cast? Yeah, after they're casted. Uh, yeah, we're, um, I mean, we do the uh, initial series casting, mm -hmm. and then um, our team of, of folks. Uh, at Disney, we have a team of like 10 people. They're all very good. Some of them are here tonight. Oh, that's so. a good point. I think some people from the Disney casting department are here. So if anyone would like to do auditions, I can have you guys pop outside right now. You can go ahead and perform for them, do like 10 characters, whatever you want to do. They'll just be waiting right outside there. Um, so, you know, I'll just, oh no, you guys don't want to stand up? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool, cool, that's weird. I don't know, it's weird. They're smart, it's weird. they're smart, that would happen. Yeah. yeah. So, no, we have a great team. So we do, you know, we cast the, the initial, uh, we do the main, the, the, we cast the initial, uh, sorry, it's kind of weird hearing my voice back. Um, let me tell you who I wouldn't cast. This guy. Um, no. So we cast the series, and then uh, we cast the pilot, and then when it goes to series, we're in charge of, we cast all the guest roles, we cast all the incidentals, um, uh, and we follow the audio basically all the way through. So somebody from our team is at every record. Um, and then uh, as, the, uh, as the show is getting critiqued, even throughout uh, the series, so we do the records, and then the story is critiqued, but the voices are in there, so we want to be involved in every part of that process so that no... Um, so when they should be giving notes on the writing, they're definitely giving notes on the writing and not trying to recast an actor because the joke didn't land or something. Um, yeah. So anyway, we're involved in the whole process. That's good. Um, and then how do you... <laughs> so we don't want to take it to a dark place yet. Ease us up to that point. Um, so when you're casting that part of the process, um, 
How do you find the actors? Is it traditional methods through agencies or non-conventional methods? How do you go about really securing actors or talent for your projects? I mean, obviously we go through the agencies, but I will say, like, I don't, um, or I don't think, we in general don't depend on the agents to be good at casting. Um, and you don't have to be a good, you don't have to be a good, you know, to be a good agent, you don't have to be good at casting. So we do not depend on them um, to be good at that. So we, uh, I just feel like we need to know their talent better than they know their talent. Um, so, but we definitely go through them to get a bunch of auditions. But I think we're also uh, constantly out at the comedy clubs, um, uh, at the improv shows. Uh, we're, you know, we found people on the internet now. Um, basically, any place we can interface with an actor, we like to be to see if we can find uh, somebody with an interesting voice who's really talented. Um, there's a ton of animation being made right now. And we are conscious of the fact that uh, our characters should sound different than other characters uh, on our shows and on competing network shows and on competing internet shows or whatever. Uh, you know, our goal would be when a kid is watching uh, our show, when they hear a voice, it doesn't immediately trigger, a like, oh, that's this other character, and then they're taken out of the show. Um, so anyway, we're constantly looking for kind of new people to bring into the animation field, and uh, yeah, I've talked enough about that too. I mean, our goal is to know everybody. We're not gonna get to know everybody, but my goal is to know everybody, and to have 10 people that can do a certain type of voice. I can't just know one person that can do it. I have to know 10 to 20. Um, you know, we were talking about turning things around very quickly. You know, say the person I need is in session, and they're not gonna be out for four hours. I have to move on and get my understudy or get my second person because I need that audio turned around right away. Um, so I can't just rely on that one person that I know. I do use the agents a lot um, just to kind of help filter people for me because there's a lot of actors out there. So I use them as the first line of defense. Great, if an actor comes up to me, a lot of times my first question is, great, do you have an agent? Because it's always best for the agent to reach out with, to me and kind of remind me of who they are. Oh, hey, you like that person you saw before, they're gonna read for this project, I think they did a great job. I like hearing that kind of feedback and uh, those kinds of notes. Um, and I see the agents a lot of times as my partners. If I was doing a project for new media, um, you know, that is all uh, up to negotiation for SAG-AFTRA. So I need to come up with a deal that makes sense that the agents are going to be on board with and the agents are going to want to sell their talent and get their talent excited about this project. So I need to use them as my partner. Hey, maybe this isn't the full $900. Would you still do it for $500 if it's a negotiable or a fast turnaround or whatever the rate is? I just made that up. Please don't anyone get upset here. It's like, Sarah said the rate was $500 and I'm going to have... Okay, no, that wasn't what I was saying. Um, but, you know, using the agent as my partner to make sure, great, I'm going to pitch this out to my bosses. Will your clients do it for this rate? Is this fair? Does this make sense? So um, I am talking to the agents a lot about those kinds of things and any kind of new talent. Um, what I thought was really interesting was my whole casting career, I'd been at Disney. And I was like, I've been doing it for 12 years. I got this. I know the actors and I know what they can do. And then I'm casting something completely different. And I'm like, I don't know these people at all. They can do that? Like, I've never cast them for that. So I didn't know they could do that. So when I started this new job, I started to go to all the agencies in Los Angeles and spend the afternoon there and re-meet talent that I already knew. You know, because I didn't do a lot of sound alike casting. I didn't have to. Um, I didn't do a lot of parodies. So then when I started doing that kind of stuff, I had to re-meet talent that I already knew. and. Um, it, yeah, so I did use the agents for that kind of um, free booth, I guess. I don't know. I could have come in here and do it. But no, but I did use the agents and their experience um, on that front. Do you cap the number of auditions you get from agencies sometimes? Or is it just whoever they want to send, do you sift through all of those auditions? And then after that, how do you sort through that part of the process? Because there could be tons of auditions you get for a particular role. So what's your method to f you know, pare it down to get to the one that you think is going to work? I think it depends on how specifically we're casting. I mean, if we're casting for a rock, anyone can read for it, any age can read for it, adults, kids, whatever the case may be, then I might have to cap the auditions. Um, the famous one that we have is that we were casting an Afro-Irish 11-year-old boy. We got six total. <laughs> You know, so I wasn't capping that one. Um, but for the most part, yeah, if I'm casting a rock, I might, you know, cut it down and say, great, just give me your top 10 rocks. Um, but if I'm casting something that is very specific and I'm casting ethnically appropriate um, for that kind of role and I want somebody with that very specific um, dialect, then, yeah, I might not limit what they 
submit. Did you have a different opinion on that? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I like everything you say. Uh, yeah, I remember we used to limit it uh, back in the day um, because, you know, uh, it is overwhelming because we get thousands of auditions when we're casting like five characters. Um, but uh, uh, I remember that process changing uh, specifically uh, uh, because one time uh, a Disney executive uh, said, hey, did you bring this person in? And I thought, that person you only know because I introduced you to them? That person? Um, I didn't say that. Anyway, so <laughs> since, that, since that time, uh, I don't limit the, the number just because I, I, I like to have a big pool um, because I never want uh, them to say, did you bring that person in? And me to be like, no. Um, so anyway, but uh, yeah, that's how we do it. Uh, and in terms of how we, how we pare it down, like we, 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 you know, we listen, I will say this, like we listen to everybody. All the way through complete or no, five seconds, 10 seconds? <laughs> Just asking. Like, I knew Please. that question was coming. I like watched the setup, no. and I was like, "Ooh, that's gonna happen." Then we're gonna say no. Look, no. here's the thing. So, you know, part of our process when we get all this this huge slew of auditions, like we're only gonna send 25 characters to the creative team, and that's not like a 25 actors. Yeah, sorry, yeah. 25. Right, 25 auditions per character, um, and that's not like a process of elimination or something. It's just like, hey, this is what we're hearing. We kind of like, this is the kind of the auditions that we're hearing, let us know your thoughts. But even sending that 25, like we know, like it's, it's really tough for a person to listen to 25 auditions. Um, so like, you know, the idea of listening to 500 or 1,000 or 1,500, like all the way through is, you know, that's terrible. Um, I'm just saying you're not gonna hear anything after a while. But uh, so, no, you know, I, I think if we have a good, uh, a good handle on the character, um, you know, we know pretty quickly if they're in the ballpark of what we're looking for. So, you know, we can know that very quickly. Yeah, I mean, there's certain things that we're looking for, right? Because we're trying to slash and burn to get from 500 auditions down to 25. So first thing that's going to eliminate you without even us having to listen to your voice is poor production quality. You decided to do your audition while the trash man was collecting your trash. You decided to do your audition in your bathroom. You decided to do your audition 10 feet away from your microphone, and I can barely hear anything. Uh, you didn't fully plug in your, some cord, and I can hear a shh throughout your whole audition. Those are things that immediately I can just delete your audition and cut it out, right? Because if I were to send it on, my bosses would say, ooh, Sarah, did you record that? Like, that's poor quality. I don't want to look bad, so that audition's going to get cut. Um, I want to know if it's the right voice. Sometimes, uh, you know, we have a teenage role and adult women or adult men read for the role, but I know they want real kids, right? So I might slash out all the adults because I know that they're not going to, um, I want to keep them for later because when they decide later, they say, oh, just kidding, we don't want kids, we want adults. I have the adult auditions, but it might be the next thing I can cut. And then um, looking for talent, looking for uh, solid acting. This is my favorite, I mean, this is, I mean, I get this all the time. I have a funny voice, I should do voiceover. I'm like, maybe, I don't, I mean, are you, can you act? Um, that's my next question. So I'm looking for people that can act. Let me rephrase that in a way that everyone understands. I'm looking for people who can act. Um, there was not a rephrasing. Um, you know, I'm also looking for people that are funny, that people are going to plus the material, people that are going to bring the characters to life, a little bit more that's on the page. If you have five lines of dialogue, what are you going to do to make it your own? What are you going to add there to uh, make it stand out? So those are all the things that we, you know, help us, and we can determine those in the first 10, 15 seconds of the audition um, to help us. So bold decisions, bold choices, sort of capture your attention a little more frequently? Or? I think so. I think when people start to say, well, there was an A option, a B option, so I kind of like went down the middle. No, I, I don't like mushy. I like when people either choose A or choose B. You got to make some decisions here. And I always get, but, but I don't know what's happening in the scene. Yeah, make a decision. I don't know what to tell you. Um, so you got to like really go with your gut, see if it's a good audition, see if it's funny. Um, do you like it? <laughs> Does it make you laugh? Um, I think all that stuff is, is great to add into. And with 25 auditions, if that's what you're sending, for instance, um, to creative, um, are they taking it down to maybe two or three actors and then it becomes a competition between those actors that are left or? Well, in our process, when we're sending 25, it's to have a discussion. It's not, um, we only start kind of paring things down once we bring uh, 
when we bring actors in. So the 25 is just like, hey, this is what we're hearing. Let us know what you hate. Let us know what surprises you. Let us know what was inspiring. Um, just to get us, because ultimately, um, up until that point, we've just had conversations with them. And I don't really trust anything anybody has to say until they've actually listened to actors. Um, but it's also subjective. Like, what yeah. do certain words mean? Oh, I really want, like, a nerdy voice. Yeah. Okay, what does that mean? You know, when it actually comes down to it. So. Yeah. But just so you guys know, they're always looking for um, something unique. <laughs> so Every single oh, we project gotta, we've cast ever, they say, I really want a unique voice for this like one. something unique for that. <laughs> so, uh, so that's always at the top of our list. Unique. Do you do a good job of finding that unique voice? Does it come across very often? <laughs> I guess the reason why I say that is because it's just like, yes, we are also looking for something unique. Anyway, what else are you looking for? Anyway, so, um, so no, so from that conversation, then when we start bringing people in, uh, then we start looking for, uh, at least, you know, at Disney specifically, then we start looking uh, to get it down to about a top two or three per role. Um, and that, you know, in terms of the callback process, like that can take however long it takes until we kind of find that. So you have two or three actors that have made it to that point, and then they come in, and what, is, what happens next at that stage? Are you, they're reading for you directly, for the other executives? or? Well, they've already been in. We've been reading a bunch of actors, and then they're like, okay, these are two or three that we like, that we think we could live with for this role. And then um, at that stage, we just uh, we go into a room, put the artwork up on the wall, uh, got the Disney execs in there, um, play the stuff, and then kind of duke it out, uh, and then come away with our... Uh, Voice. Should we check in with you, Eric? Are we being too cynical? Should we, <laughs> should we change the direction of this? No, that's no, what do you that's, think? That's my thing. Okay. We, we should probably. Okay. Let's. We let's like reality, I think, bit. right? Let's but it's, it it's nice. I mean, it's real. Uh, so you don't really have that luxury, did you? I mean, of, of calling tons of people in, right. like you said. So it's a different um, process. Right? Yeah, that was more of the yeah. Disney process. Uh, yeah. What I was doing there is I was getting uh, much fewer auditions because it was whoever was available that moment. What was your list of, you must have tons of people at your fingertips or available or to consider. Yeah, yeah, you know, it, was, it was tough. A huge Thank you for acknowledging it. It was yeah, a really tough well, job. Yeah. Thank you. Um, once in a while. No, yeah. but I, I mean, yeah, I would have to take the roles and then quickly get it out to agents. I would say, please read these people and let me know if you have anyone else that you think um, I should add to my list. That person's in a session they can't read. Okay, then they're off the list. And so I'm trying to get things turned around as quickly as possible. And, um, yeah, it's do we sacrifice, like, you know, do we wait uh, to get our project out a little later to get someone out of a session, or do we just kind of keep the train moving? So we had a lot of tough decisions like that. Um, so, yeah, it was real fast. I don't know how to say that any other way. Um, but, um, so I didn't have the luxury of getting 500 auditions always for this. I mean, I get a lot of auditions. Um, in the beginning, like, if I was casting some of the major players, I, I wouldn't have to do such a fast turnaround. I would just see who's out there, and then I could be getting a lot of auditions and then kind of call that down. But the things that I had to turn around very quickly, like the new voices, um, you know, I might get 20 or 25 auditions and then send along my top three. Just to throw it in there, um, we always talk about demos here. Um, people are really sort of obsessed, not obsessed, but it's an important... <sighs> Way to brighten it up, man. We can always cut that out, I guess. But um, <laughs> demos are very important, uh, the calling cards. So um, we've heard different things. So from a casting director perspective, in terms of how you handle things, how important is that? to the process for you, I mean, of, of finding talent and everything and discovering folks? Uh, well, you, you know, we don't, we don't uh, at least where I work, we don't use demos a whole lot in terms of the casting process just because when we need an audition, we can just get an audition. Um, uh, I have used them in the past in terms of if I need to prove to a producer um, that a certain actor has is versatile and has a lot of range, um, then I can get their demo and be like, no, look, they can, they can do this. Um, but for the most part, you know, I, I just think it's, it's, it's a good way to show your agent what you can do so they know how versatile you are and the voices that you can do. Um, I think it's good for people starting out to get in a booth and do a bunch of different voices. So if it takes making a demo to do that, then that's great. Um, and then obviously finding an agent it's good for. But uh, 
Yeah, I don't use them a whole lot. Um, maybe on like a, a hyper schedule, I might need to, but. I mean, I don't care if you can do 20 voices, I need you to be able to do the one voice that I'm currently casting. You know, so it's like, I don't want to hear a demo of two minute long, you know, I want to hear my audition. Um, so I would use it, I guess, to see if you had good vocal separation, if I could assign you a second role, you know, because it's free. Okay, um, but uh, you know, if you can cover a second role in a script or even a third role. So if your uh, demo has good vocal separation, I know that. So now, you've, Sarah, you've come and you've taught a couple of workshops or classes here at the foundation, and they've been great. Um, Thank you. Yes, um, but I noticed you have a really, in terms of coaching actors and directing, you do that really well. So is this just from years of experience? You have a really good ear for this stuff. So what kinds of things you. do you <laughs> do you lock in on to, to really extract great performances? What do you what do you push or look for when you're working with an actor? Yeah, well, I'm all about the actors creating this dynamic performance, and that's pretty much what I preach the you know entire way is yeah there are some characters that are one note and that's their joke and they're going to be one note but for the most part our characters need to be dynamic they need to adjust the pitch the pace and the volume um, and have you know variance in there so I'm always pushing my actors to do that I'd say is my big my big push that's what you're known for yeah so I'd say that your signature I'd say that. my signatures do you have a signature <laughs> come on Aaron you have something <laughs> in there I think something uh, I am not aware of a signature <laughs> None? <laughs> um, in terms of like teaching people? What are we talking teaching, about? Teaching, coaching, working with talent, intimate settings. What is your big thing that you tell talent or that you're always trying to get out of talent in the booth? I got loads of stuff I'm telling them. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, look, uh, you know, when we're reading people, you know, you got to be thinking about the fact that you're kind of competing with like 500 other people that are reading for the same role. <laughs> So my point being this, it's like um, you want to check and make sure that, that that first instinct that you have on this line or on a line, is that the first instinct everybody's going to have? Because your job is to differentiate yourself from everybody else. So in terms of the, the thing before, when you're talking about bold choices, um, I will say that the people who do this five days a week, four jobs a day, um, probably make the... Uh, you know, most interesting choices, um, you know, probably because they're just going to have fun and they don't care if they get the job. Um, but ultimately, like, yeah, differenti differentiate yourself and make sure that you're experimenting with interesting choices if you're going to be, you know, auditioning for, for us. You also talk a lot about adding sounds and adding laughs and stuff. That is true. Um, uh, you know, look, be a... Uh, if this is something you, you, you want to get into and do, like be a student of animation, like watch, like just watch a lot of animation. Like you don't have to be a huge animation nerd, but when you're watching animation, like think about the actor alone in the booth and realize what the words are on the page versus what you're hearing because there's a ton of physicality happening. And unlike on camera stuff, like we don't want you to just read the words on the page, um, like pre-life, post-life, uh, Noises like you know the stuff. Uh, the lines are recorded before the stuff is animated, so the artists are looking to the actor for inspiration when it comes to shoulder shrugs or eye rolls or all that stuff. Like uh, we want to hear that stuff, and that is all, you know, noise based. Yeah, we want people to create a visual experience from you know listening to your audition, right? So when I close my eyes and I listen to your audition, I can picture what's happening in the scene. You know, I tell my students all the time, okay, so uh, what is this actor doing physically? They're like, well, they're in a room. And I'm like, no, but like, what are they doing? Are they sitting? Are they standing? And they're like, I don't know. And I was like, make something up. You know, decide, are they running around in circles? We want to hear the, <laughs> all those kinds of things. If they're running around in circles, you have to bring these characters to life, really set the scene um, and help us get that visual performance. Along with what Aaron's saying, this is your chance to give the artistic input then the artist is then going to draw off of your performance. So as much, you know, as many tools as you can give them of sounds and uh, funny things that you do with your voice um, that make sense, not just random noises like R2-D2 or something, I don't know, part way through, um, that makes sense for the character, then the artist is going to get some more meat to play with and get something to, you know, make a funny facial expression and things like that and you're only going to um, plus the material. Yeah, and if we're talking about like performance and auditioning and so forth and bringing these characters to life like one little great cheat is um, 
is, uh, you know, laughter. And, you know, you think about iconic animated characters and you think about their laughs um, and you realize that, you know, an actor came up with that. Um, so if I'm some, you know, art school kid and I just got out of art school and I've been drawing this character for three years and then I just went through this process at Disney where it's like they got me in there and I, they go through the development it's like, oh my God, it takes forever. I've been there for like a year and a half and I finally got to meet the casting department and I'm like, I guess I'm finally going to do a pilot and this is great. I've just been drawing this guy and now they send me these they send me these auditions and this is the first time, even though this guy's been living in my head for like three and a half years, that I'm gonna hear this character that I've been drawing. The moment that they hear that laugh, which they didn't write in the sides, they didn't write laugh, um, it's like seductive, like there's this thing that happens. So always laugh in your auditions. <laughs> and not just your laugh, but like the character laugh. Uh, it's incredibly important. And it doesn't have to be a laugh at something funny. It could be a sarcastic laugh, a chuckle, a chortle, all those different kinds of things that you could do, a ha, whatever it is, um, because only you're going to do the kind of laugh that you're going to do and put it in the place that you're going to put it, and immediately that is going to separate your audition. So. I've cast a character off of a laugh. I've also cast a character off of a laugh. Really? What are you talking about? Wow. Are you gold. Talking about the same person? No. We're giving you gold here, guys. Um, any backstage we're talking about funny stories in the world of casting that you've come across um, Anything you'd like to share about things that we are being recorded. We are being recorded <laughs> yeah. Setting the stage setting the stage um, Unusual stories unusual situations things that stand uh, Oh out. goodness uh, Okay You go <laughs> Ultimately, let me just say this, you know uh, uh, you know, voice acting, you know, being in the booth, voice acting, you might think like, oh, you know, voice acting, whatever. Look, it's hard. You know, you can, you can work. They can work you in the booth. So, you know, if you're coming from the gym, like, take a shower um, <laughs> before an audition. Or just, you know, like, you, know, you can wear deodorant guy. and stuff like that in the booth is good because sometimes you get sweaty, so I'd wear deodorant. Yeah, don't be that guy. Um, because it, people will remember. Yeah, I think it, what the funny, I mean, funny stories is that like literally someone came into our booth and then like then they opened the door and they left and this like waft of horribleness came out of the booth after them and I was like whoa, and I almost fell over. It was very, uh, it was very smelly. Um, so that's what Aaron is referring to. Um, also, I guess uh, you know the big thing is oh you can do voiceover in your pajamas. Maybe you don't. Um, <laughs> Like, you can, yeah, I mean, that's true, that's a fact, you can show up, I'm not gonna videotape you always, um, but like, maybe you don't show up in your pajamas. Little thing, that's maybe my tip. Maybe, maybe not until you get the role. <laughs> yeah, then once you book the role, you know, maybe sign a contract or something. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, you know. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, <laughs> In terms of casting victories or things that you're really proud of, um, can you share some of those, uh, those with us as well? I love um, giving someone their first job in voiceover. Yeah. That's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, someone that had never heard of it, or I mean, they've heard of animation, but didn't actually think of it for them, for themselves, um, and then being able to see them and uh, give them a role, that's really exciting for me. Um, I also love being right about things, so like if I, like, I'm like, oh, this person's gonna be great, and they're like, no, that's not our person, and I'm like, it is our person, and then we go through 500 auditions, and then we come back, and it's that person, I'm like, mm -hmm. I feel good. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, then I feel, then I feel good. No, but um, like I do, I love giving people their first role, I would say, you know, that is a, that's a real victory, and then having the show go four seasons, and that person sustaining the role, um, that's really exciting to me. And then they go off, and they get booked with other studios, and things like that, and I'm like, wow, well, we started that for them. It's exciting. Yeah, I mean, I agree with both of those things. Um, uh, and I knew, like, whichever one of us said that first, that's great. I mean, you get to it, whatever. Um, no, it's great. Honestly, like, that's the best thing when we feel like, like, oh, we're helping this person. Like, they're, they've been dreaming of this. They haven't got a job yet. Um, we've been auditioning them uh, on, like, pilots for two or three years. And finally, like, they nail a role. And it's like, oh, gosh, this is great. Um, I think also when we uh, kind of um, 
you know, really connect with a creative team um, when they, you know, have faith in us and we're just like, look, you're going to love this guy. We're just going to bring him in for this role. Like, just give us this opportunity. And then you do that and not only do they like the actor, but then that character that was only a one-off in one episode suddenly comes back because we've done our job and found a great actor. Um, and, and then suddenly the next time they get a show, like that that actor is now maybe a lead on their next show. So, uh, you know, that's all good. But I mean, honestly, uh, it's a casting victory anytime we cast a, a lead. Um, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because even though, you know, all these shows are for Disney, Disney Junior, Disney XD, Disney Channel, um, they do have different feels. I mean, yes, they all have the same brand of Disney, but each executive producer is different for what they're looking for. Um, and that's why the team mentality is so great. And again, I'm not going to point out the team in case anyone has their demo ready, but the team being here um, is that we have to be prepared. We have to watch every show that's out there because we never know what they're going to reference. Oh, did you guys see that episode of the new Twilight Zone in the third one where the guy comes in, he says, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll turn to my team, did anyone see that? Or my, my former team and say, did anyone see that? And they said, yes, I did. It's this actor. Great. Yes, I did. It's this actor. He's fantastic. We actually had him in already or whatever the case may be. Because sometimes executive, executive producers are looking for celebrities. Sometimes they only want to work with voice actors that can do multiple roles. Sometimes they're looking for uh, kids, real kids to play the roles. Sometimes they want adults to play the kid roles. Um, sometimes they want only comedians. Sometimes they want all new talent that have never done this before and aren't on any other show ever. Um, so we have to adjust our casting and our theories and our philosophies of what we're doing in our process to match those executive producers. So does it come down to a consensus then in terms of who gets to make the final choice for a particular character, who gets a role, or is that up to the, the cast? Whoever role? makes the most in the room gets to make the decision. <laughs> no, but uh, it's either, you know, the head of TV animation and the Disney uh, perspective, or um, the executive producer, or in my case, um, like John Stewart would have the final say um, in it. If he wasn't there, then the next person down. And ultimately, it's the, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's how the kind of the piece comes together. It's like initially when you pick the role, yeah, it's a decision-making tree. And although each project is kind of different, like somebody is going to be the one that, that approves it. Um, <clears throat> but the casting process doesn't stop there. Like we keep, as we're, as they're performing and as they're recording episodes, like there's continual critiques. And if it's a pilot, then there's continued focus testing and so forth. So ultimately like we pick the actors but ultimately it's whether or not the project's kind of working for everybody uh, and whether or not they keep the role so yeah. is it common that you would replace like even principal like members that you've cast early in the process change the the voice actor somewhere midway through a season or something or is that an uncommon thing does that ever occur oh that's a tough one. Oh, sorry oh, <laughs> um, look, it's a very fluid. Uh, it's a very fluid process, and I'll just say, you know, in terms of TV production, like we're, um, it's just intense all the way through. Like we never have like a moment to kind of breathe. Um, you know, projects are in in development. They're greenlit to series. They're going to series. Um, it's just we're turning out a lot of just we're just turning out a ton of content. So um, recasting can happen at any point. It happens. Um, it happens behind the scene too with writers and executive producers. It's just a, it's a, yeah, it can happen now. But it can come from both sides. You know, um, animation takes second position to a lot of live action or to live action. So if somebody books, um, you know, something that is going to be, you know, bigger and, you know, they, in their contract, they're not allowed to do animation, they might pull out of the show. Um, we are on day player contracts for the most part. So people come in for the day with the agreement that they're going to be on for the whole season, the handshake kind of thing, um, but nothing written. So um, if they book something that precludes them from being able to do uh, our stuff, then that happens. Um, and uh, I mean, so it happens on, on both ends there. Um, you mentioned earlier about um, sometimes social media is a component as well. I believe we uh, touched on that. How relevant is that now in this day and age with so many you know, people that are online, they have tons of followers and they want to break into it? Does that come down to decisions that are decided based upon social media following or status for animation in particular? Uh, I mean, it's, I don't think it, uh, at least it hasn't really leaked into our business in terms of playing a huge role in whether or not we cast somebody. I will say that, uh, so when we go into that, into that room, uh, 
with the Disney execs, and we're going to decide, like, out of these two or three actors, which one's going to get the role. Um, you know, I will say, uh, it does come up. It's like, okay, let's listen to these voices. Let's play this one. You know, the question's going to come up. was like, who is that? Um, and then we have to become salesmen very quickly for this, for this actor. Um, so we'll mention whether or not, like, oh, they're totally new to animation, they've done some commercials, or, oh, they're an improv actor and they're young and just, um, if they have, like, yeah, if there's a social media thing, they're like, oh, yeah, they got, like, a million followers on whatever. Um, so it, you know, but at the, at the end of the day, uh, it's not going to, I mean, at least it hasn't yet. It's more of the icing on top. You know, it's like, I mean, they have to have the cake or the dessert, you know, and then it's, oh, great, and they also have this, and they can help uh, with publicity as well. Um, that's for positive. There also could be the negative side of it, too. You know, I mean, if you think about Disney, it has a certain brand to uphold, and if there is a performer who has a certain amount of followers that is doing something that is maybe um, not favorable to the Disney brand, that could hurt them, I think. That could hurt their choices. Standards and practices could say no. And just a note here, anything negative that I say is normally uh, regards uh, the freelance work I've done, uh, not, not, not any of the stuff that's happened at Disney. Noted, noted. Yes. See, you are funny, Aaron. You are. You are. Um, for the actors out here uh, seeking um, ways to kind of break into the world of animation, any sort of pointers or inside tips you can offer up? that might be helpful, skills they should possess? I know we touched on it earlier a little bit, but um, what do you have? I mean, acting, acting classes are fantastic. I can't stress those enough. Uh, improv classes are great as well. Um, adding your personality to your characters that you create. Um, you know, you do you, right? So add that to the sides, add that to the character. Um, if we're coming after you, we're usually coming after you because you have something very special that you possess and that we want. Um, so I would try to get that, influence that um, into your performance. Yeah, um, just be prepared, really. Be prepared for when you get that opportunity. Um, you know, so have experience in the booth if you can. Um, you know, uh, if you have an opportunity to learn from somebody like Sarah, um, do it. Uh, yeah, in terms of what Sarah said about like, uh, you know, you be you, it's, uh, you know, we say that a lot in terms of like, hey, you know, the one thing you have that no other actor has, that's your voice. So, uh, you know, don't lean too heavily on kind of doing other people, I guess. Uh, because chances are we can hire them. <laughs> there it is. Ta da. All right. Good to go. So, um, that's what I got. That's what I've got. Uh, thank you all for being here, Sarah Sherman, Aaron Drown. We appreciate it. Have a good night. <laughs>